So now you've seen how the tool works, it's time to dig in a bit deeper and see what's actually happening under the hood and some of the more advanced options and usage. So initially, when you open up your window and you hit generate assets, the important thing that's happening here is it's creating the painting data and the whole data as assets that exist inside your project. And you can see the paths here to the painting data and to the whole data. And you can find those in your project view as well. The key thing about these is this stores all of your painting data, your whole markup and all of your settings. And it keeps it separate from the object and it keeps it separate from what the game will need at runtime. And this means that when you build your game, you don't get any overhead, any additional data. You just get the raw colliders that you've offered that you wanted. And what Generate does is it creates these assets, links them to this specific object and its mesh. And now it's all linked. The window displays all of that data in a way that you can change things and generate your colliders. The other thing this lets you do is this disconnect from assets button will unlink. So the object will remain in the scene or in its prefab. The generated colliders will remain on the object ready to use by the physics engine. And the assets will remain in your project, but they will no longer be linked. At this point, the object or prefab is just a standard Unity object with no additional data and no CPU overhead. Now, if you want to come back to an object later, we can click the object here and using the reconnect option, click the circle and select the data that you previously had associated with this object. This will relink and you can edit and continue to update and regenerate the colliders as needed, just picking up where you left off last time. Now you don't have to disconnect and reconnect every single time you want to make an update. Instead, what I tend to do is leave it connected through most of development. And then when you're getting near the end of development and you're ready to start making builds and shipping your actual game, you can disconnect things to remove that final link. So you're just shipping the minimal amount of data and with no overhead. Now by default, the painting data and the hull data will be created in a folder called physics hulls. And if that doesn't exist, it'll be created for you. You can move this folder wherever you want, depending on how you want to organize your project. The important file is this physics creator hull folder asset. And that marker tells the system where new hull and painting data will be created. So as long as you move the folder with this inside, it will all update nicely. And there's no reason why you can't move these assets around individually. This is just where new ones are going to be created when you press the generate button. So now you know the basics of how the data is handled. Let's go through the UI and talk about it in a bit more depth. As you can see, the UI is broken down into its major sections, going from the top, tools, hulls, auto hull settings, defaults, settings, and assets. This first button on the tools bar is the pipette. This lets you select an individual hull to paint just by clicking on this, and then by clicking on the hull you'd like to change. You can see that after using the pipette, the paint button on this column shows this is the hull that we've selected for painting and the pipette tool goes back to the painting tool so you can start painting. Of course, if you know what you want, you can just click the paint button directly or if you want to stop painting, you can press the stop button at the bottom of the column. Next up, we've got the four different brush sizes, the precise, small, medium and large. And you can see when you select one of these, the cursor in the scene view changes to show the selection radius. If you've got a brush selected and a hull selected, you can start painting your faces. Just use the left click and drag, and you can paint faces and add them to your current hull. If you start your drag where there isn't already painted, it will start adding to your selection. And if you start where there's already a selection, then it will start removing. Or you can use shift and the cursor gets the little plus, and that will always add to your current painting selection. Or you can hold control, and the cursor will get this little minus and it will always remove from the current selection. The next buttons let you change your current painting selection. So this first one is select all, that's simple. You click it, it selects all faces. Next up we have invert. So if you've only painted some faces, then you can press invert and you will get the opposite of what you've painted. Select unpainted will select any which isn't used by any hull. 
So in this particular example, you see we've got a few unpainted faces around the hilt. Then we've got grow and shrink selection. So if you have a selection you've already painted, then grow will expand it to adjacent triangles and you can keep pressing grow and it will spread over the surface of the object and then shrink does the opposite. And then the last button here is select knob. Now on the far right, you've got the generate colliders button. This will take all of your hull data, all of your settings and create game objects and colliders and update their settings as necessary. If colliders have already been generated, it will update them the new sizes and properties. And then if you change something like the child toggle, then it will create and remove child game objects as needed. And then next to that is the delete colliders. If you want to go back to the original state with no colliders generated, you can click that and it will remove all colliders that the tool has generated. Moving on, we've got the hulls section. This table shows all the hulls you've created and the settings you've chosen for each one. When you press the generate button, each hull you've made in this table will correspond to one collider created. The exception is the auto type, which will run the VHKAD algorithm and create multiple colliders that represents that painting selection. The first column lets you control the visibility of each hull. So you can toggle the visibility on and off and the all button at the bottom toggles visibility for all hulls. Next, we've got the name column. You can name your hulls for easier organization. And if a hull has been marked as an as child, this name will be used for the child game object that's created. You can see at the bottom of the name column, we've got the add hull button. So when you're painting an object for the first time, you'll start with an initial empty hull. But to add more, you just click this add hull button. The color box is just the color used in the overlay in the scene view. So you can distinguish the different hulls. And then the type column. This is an important one because this controls how your painted selection will be converted into a collider. And these largely correspond to actual collider types that Unity has. So the box type will generate a box collider. The convex hull will create a mesh collider as a convex hull. Sphere will create a sphere collider. Face treats the selection as a flat-ish surface and extrudes it out to create a face. Face's box is the same, but uses a box collider. Capsule uses the capsule collider component. And then auto will run the auto hull settings to segment the space and create as many colliders as are necessary to fill up that volume. The materials column lets you assign a physics material to each hull, which in turn will be used for the generated collider. And you can see that the material assigned to the hull has been passed through to the generated collider down here. Next, we have the fit column. Certain types, such as box, have different fitting methods. Different fitting methods are different algorithms that controls how the shapes are wrapped around your painted surfaces. So for example, the axis method for fit will create colliders that are aligned to the object's axes, whereas tight allows them to rotate to provide smaller, more accurate colliders. Next, we've got the as child column. It's ticked, it means this collider will create a new child game object and the collider will be added there. The as child is useful if you want to separate out different colliders so they're on different objects, possibly because you need to distinguish them via script or callbacks as different parts of your model and treat them different for gameplay reasons. The trigger column is used to control the is trigger option on a collider. The paint column we've already gone over. And finally, we have the delete column, which will just delete this hull. Remember that if you delete a hull, you need to press generate colliders again to delete the generated collider. It's important that you don't edit the colliders manually. The colliders are supposed to be read only. And if you want to edit them, you need to go back to this UI and change them here. Because otherwise, the next time you press generate, any individual modifications you've made to the colliders will be overwritten. Next, we come to the auto hull settings. Now you'll see these are grayed out at the moment. That's because we don't have any hulls set to auto. I want to set one to auto then the preset option becomes enabled. 
and we can choose a quality preset. In general, I would recommend starting with medium as this is a good trade-off between accuracy and processing time and then bump that up to high if you need something more accurate. Or if you need to configure the individual sliders yourself, then you can choose the custom preset. And then if you want to go back to the defaults, just press the reset to default. Next, we have the default section. These are the defaults that will be used the next time you click add hull. So the type that will be set, whether it is set as a child, whether it is marked as a trigger, and what its default material will be. So we click this add hull here, and you'll see it's come in with the box type, the wood material, and it already has the as child tick. And then if you want to change all of your hulls at once, you can click the apply to all, and you can see we've clicked apply to all, and now all of our hulls are set to box, which can be useful when working with large amounts of hulls. At the bottom of our default section, we've got the face thickness. This is the thickness used when the type dropdown is set to face. Now, if you just skip ahead a little, you'll see at the bottom in the settings, there are tick boxes for each column at the top. Because depending on what you're working on, or depending on what's important to you, certain columns are not terribly interesting and you want to focus on others. You can control which columns are shown so you can cut down the UI to the bare minimum you want and what's important to you. In a similar way, each of these sections is a separate fold out so you can collapse all of the sections so you just see what you need to see when you're working on a specific task. We've already looked at the columns but we've got three other options. The first is the wireframe overlay, which can be helpful when you're trying to be precise about which triangles you're painting. The tick box on the far right turns the wireframe on and off, and the slider controls the intensity and also fades between black and white, which can be helpful depending on what textures or how bright your scene is. Dim other hulls can also be turned off by this checkbox on the far right. When you have a single hull that you've selected to paint, the inactive hulls are dimmed, so it's clear which one you're painting. The tick box turns its effect on and off, and then a slider controls its intensity. Finally, we have a transparency slider, which controls how visible this overlay is in the scene. 